For me, the way that I usually generate books is, and this is only one method, all right? This is one of the tools to stick in your toolbox and see if it works for you. Um, the way that I generate so books, ah, uh, you're fine. Um, the way that I generate books is that I am always watching for things that don't even necessarily fit completely into the, um, to the friction section, but fit, fit into the plot or character or the setting section. Meaning I've got this like, I get this cool setting idea. Um, I'll, I'll use Mistborn again because it's um, one of my most famous works and many of you may have read it, but it involves, you know, these, these misty nights. <clears throat> I, um, I just, I drove through a patch of fog at 70 miles an hour and thought it looked cool. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm going to write that down. Um, that's an interesting visual. It's an interesting setting element. Someday I want to use that in a book. Um, I visited uh, the National Cathedral in um, Washington, D.C. and loved how stained glass windows were lit up at night, shining out into the, um, into the darkness and onto you know, just on the things out there. And I thought, wow, if I combine that with the misty nights, you've got these beautiful, radiant lights shining out into mist and making these patterns that through the, you know, from a distance will just look like these glowing balls of light um, of various colors. That's a great image. I'm going to save that. Um, and I'm going to slowly, what I do is over time, slowly combine ideas until I build a story. It's almost like, uh, to use another science metaphor, I was a, I was a chemist um, my first year at BYU. Um, it's like a molecule being built, right? Where things are reacting, and you've got you know, your thing, and your thing here, and your thing here, and your thing here. And they slowly are like building chains with all these ideas working together. And then they start to make links like this and things. And suddenly, you've got this cool story where different things are creating links, conflicts, or relationships in ways that they slowly grow into a novel. Um, when I have enough of these, then I usually sit down and I make, for myself, um, a book guide. Um, this is a document where I open it up, uh, Microsoft Word. Um, I open up the document map, map on the side, which I, um, I like, and I say, you know, plot, setting, character. And I highlight all of these as heading um, number one, and then I write down these with the relationships kind of underneath them on here as my starting points as kind of my subheadings. You know, setting, we've got misty nights. We've got ash falling from the sky. Um, plot. We've got um, you know a gang of thieves trying to uh, overthrow the Dark Lord. Um, we've got um, character. We've got um, this guy who was once um, a a kind of gentleman thief who was out for himself. And then something terrible happened in his past, and now he's um, it, he's out kind of more for revenge. He doesn't want to just rob the Dark Lord. He wants to topple him completely, though he's using the robbery as a method to kind of get everyone else on board. Um, each of these things were developed separately. Um, these characters were developed separately in most cases, and then interwove and connected, and I build my, um, my setting guide out of that. Okay? Do you typically like, write down these ideas as they occur? Do you like, uh, um, so often I do. Um, this is this is my little writer's notebook sort of thing I carry around. Here's a here's a gummy bear. Um, yes, question. Oh, you asked one too, didn't you? Yeah. Um, I like red. You do? Oh, okay. Um, uh, I usually write them down. I actually have a document on my computer I call "Cool Stuff That Has to Be Used Sometime." <laughs> And actually, what I usually do is once I've done this, I open up the cool stuff document and I go through and see if anything else fits in here. Kind of more trying to make some of these connections. And I try out different things on here. Um, from there, I start brainstorming to fill it in. Okay? And this is where I devise things. Um, I've, I've spoken about before at uh, Mistborn, there are three magic systems. Um, Allomancy, Ferrochemy, Hemology. Um, Allomancy and Ferrochemy were developed de differently and distinctively for different books. <coughs> I eventually um, started writing this one to have Allomancy. I pulled Ferrochemy from the cool things that need to be used sometime because it worked really well <coughs> with Allomancy in an interesting way. And then I needed a third one for the plot structure that I was building, and so I developed Hemalurgy rather than kind of brain um, letting it you know, come more organically at that point and put it into the story because this, this thing's going to have holes in it. So my process then is to fill in the holes by, by, um, by 
by patching them, by brain, um, brainstorming, by figuring out what needs to happen. And I do a lot of reworking here. And that is where my book guide comes from. Um, usually, this is the most extensive um, first off for me. Okay? Character, I'll have one or two lines about everybody with their major passions and conflicts. Um, but I won't go too far into who they become. Because as I said, I tend to discover to write my characters and I'll need to try them a few times before I know who they are. Um, at this point, my next step is the plot. <coughs> um, I plot backward and then write forward. And so under here, these are my plot brainstorms. This is really my outline. Um, and with my outline, I then start with the cool things I want to have happen in the book. Um, awesomeness trumps almost everything for me. I can find a way to make something work if it's awesome. That's one of my secrets. Um, perhaps I should admit that. I should be like, oh, no, it's all, you know, it, it all, no. I, I make it awesome first, and then I make it make sense. I can do that because I'm developing um, everything, you know, sort of free form here where I can change things. If I come up with a great idea, I'm going to take it. I'm not going to say, oh, that won't work. Now, once I've written the book, Sequels I have to throw away sometimes, ideas that, that might be um, awesome, because at that point I've given myself canon, and consistency sometimes trumps m uh, minor amounts of awesomeness. All right? Um, as fun as it would be to add some crazy new thing into the Mistborn world, it usually isn't going to be appropriate, because at that point I've, I've got consistency. But that, if that becomes a problem for you, that's a good problem to have because it means you're getting published and people are reading your books and then you have to worry about canon, okay? So that's not a big deal for most of you. Um, yet, yet, it will be a big deal for all of you. Yes, go ahead. So like, okay, you're really terrible at catching That's all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Notice how I give you a new one so the one I've been squishing my fingers? I'm such a good future. <laughs> um, my setting, like, do you, you're saying it's most extensive, but do you mean like, you're like getting like city names and like... No, naming stuff, stuff is not important. Right. Don't waste so, your time too much on naming stuff. Okay, that's what I thought. So you mean more like... Like a general, like... The atmosphere this is and level feel. Of technology. Yes, this is level of technology. Like we'll do an entire day on this. Okay. Um, but yeah, that also, um, cultural setting. The religions, the governments, um, the history, these kinds of things. I kind of divide setting, um, really, when we'll talk about this, into two categories, which is kind of the, um, the physical setting and the um, cultural. This is the kind of the stuff that would exist with or without the people getting involved, and this is the stuff that the people create. Um, and so, and one thing to keep in mind as an aside about setting, different books have different focuses. And with setting, don't think you have to do it all, okay? Um, even Tolkien didn't do it all, and he took 20 years um, building a setting. For one book, you may need a very distinctive set of languages because your story is about the differences between these cultures in part and their interacting and their con conflict <coughs> between their different ways of thinking. You'll need to have very distinctive naming styles for the different cultures and you'll want to have you know, some, some work built into languages and things like that. For another book, the culture may be homogeneous. You may have just basically one taking place in one city, and yeah, you'll have some little cultural influences, but it's mainly people from the same culture. If you're writing, for instance, a, um, a Regency fantasy, um, they're basically going to have one, you know, culture. You'll, you're going to have a cast of 12 instead of a cast of 500. They can all come from the same culture. You don't spend your time then building all the different kingdoms around that are not going to really interact. Don't spend your time there. Um, in some books, you will want to world build the religions very deeply. In other books, you'll want to world build the science very deeply. <coughs> In other books, you can ignore that because they aren't points of conflict and they aren't, um, you know, your book is not going to live or die on them. At that point, I would not build them ahead of time very much. Whatever your comfort level is, but you only need to be, you know, vaguely aware of these things, you know, it'd be nice in your Jane Austen book to know what the other kingdoms are and the kind of the relationships, but you know, we're talking like two or three hours worth of brainstorming rather than two or three weeks worth of brainstorming for that sort of thing. So, um, my outline. 
I build my outline backward. I build my outline by starting with the coolest moments, um, the most powerful character moments, the most powerful plot moments. Um, usually they're, pl um, they're big plot moments, but other times they are, it, they're actually scenes that I think will fit into this book. And I start with these, and then I work backward in my plot, saying, what do I need to have happen before this can occur in a way that's very, um, that, that's fulfilling. So if you are writing um, a romantic subplot, and you have two characters, and of course, then your big moment is when they, um, they profess their love for each other and get together, right? The hookup. Um, if, your, if your end thing is the hookup, then you will say, okay, what do I need to have happen? What are my list of, of occurrences before we can have that moment? What, what things will make this moment more powerful? What things will make it really shine? What things, you know, what problems need to happen first? And I will actually world build those, or um, outline those backward, and then work forward, okay? When I write my book, I work forward. Now, the thing about this is, I usually have um, about a dozen of these different things with bullet points underneath them in my outline. My outline is not, this happens and this happens, it is, here is this subplot, and here are a bunch of things, the things that need to happen for the subplot to work. And here is this thing, and we'll do a whole day on plotting, so don't worry too much about this right now. But the idea is that when I'm going to write a scene, I'll grab the next bullet point of this one, and, you know, we've got this uh, mystery plot over here, the next thing revealed here, and I'll kind of shake them up together, devise what the best setting and viewpoint will be, and then I'll write the scene achieving those goals. Um, so I'm a goal-based writer. Another way to, uh, to view this is uh, the points on the map philosophy. Uh, some writers have described it as, I know I'm starting in San Diego, I'm driving to Washington, D.C., that I know. Now, where do we want to visit along the way? Well, I'm pretty sure I want to go here and here and here, just on my travels. All right, so these are my points on my map. Let's then fill in this part, these parts and make them interesting. Um, that is one way that people write books. I'm not going to drive the, draw a map of the United States because then you would know <coughs> how horrible an artist I am. And it's better for you to imagine that. <laughs> Imagine me being a terrible artist. Um, so, questions there. Questions about how to start and how to brainstorm, how to um, how to begin working on your story. Yes. Um, so for these different subplots that you yes. have, you have like the hookup and then the mystery the yeah. story. Do you just have like a big list of these, and then you, as you're going along, you're like, oh, I need something. I need to progress this thing, and so you go and, and just check it off. Yeah. Okay. That's basically it. And I get an instinct for which ones I need to do next. Okay. How do you know what won't work when you're brainstorming? Uh, you don't always. Um, a lot of experience, a lot of practice. Um, generally, it's worth giving a try. Some uh, pitfalls you can fall into. Um, sometimes, now I say you want to have lots of ideas, but you do want your lots of ideas to work together in good ways, to be kind of somewhat cohesive. Um, I do run into new writers occasionally who kind of have the, the everything and the kitchen sink philosophy, which is like they're trying to, to write four books at once and they can't decide which book they want it to be. That can be a problem. Um, the, the difficulty there is I, you have to kind of diagnose those separately because I would say seven out of ten writers don't put enough ideas in and then, you know, three other writers, if they have seven out of ten who have a problem with this. The other three are stuffing in everything in the kitchen sink. And they're like, I'm going to write a paranormal romance, also a uh, regency that's also this, that's also, you're going to have space penguins, and it's all going to take place in an alternate dimension, and they're all characters in a book, but they don't know it, and the book is being written, and they're self, they become self-aware, and da, 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 boom! Um, so there's a, there is a fine balance to be had between streamlining and making sure things are co cohesive enough, and also filling your story with enough ideas that it's interesting to talk about for you. How much do you talk, talk with other people about the ideas when you're like, brainstorming for your book before you, or like compared to writing? Do you talk to people a lot? Um, you, you know, most of the time I'm doing it without talking to people. 
once in a while I will brainstorm with people on a larger project or something like that. But usually it's just me. The thing is, that's going to be very situational depending on how you work. Um, I have people in my writing group that, that thrive on, here's this idea, kick back to me the different ways it could go so I can like, have all of these and juggle them and then decide how I really want to tell my story. All right. Later on, once you became a... Hey, these uh, are your gummy bears. Yeah, I'm going to throw you one of your gummy bears back. Yeah. Um, Woo, hey, I, oh, I almost beamed her. <laughs> so, so once you began to consider yourself a professional writer, how, how important was your writing group to you? I mean, is it still as important to you now as it was back when you were still like in our position? I would say for me it is. Um, I, I tend to write very quick first drafts relatively. Quick meaning, you know, I mean, writing the last Wheel of Time book took me a year. That's quick for a book of its length in the business. Um, it's not like I'm writing a weekend, but um, I tend to write very quick, relatively clean first drafts because I do plot my outline and my world fairly extensively. Um, however, because of that, I'm usually, I usually have medium level, chapter level problems that I don't spot because I'm not reworking it and going over the, um, the possibilities and plausibilities as much as someone who's maybe a discovery writer that kind of really thinks their way through as they're going. And so my writing group, they're not generally picking out large scale problems with my book. Um, they are usually sit, giving me chapter by chapter. In this chapter, I think you really forgot this, or in this chapter, I was confused here, or what about this sort of things that are very useful to me. How do you balance writing and researching? Like, if you have your plot points, right. I find that I get so distracted with researching that I right. get to writing. How do you balance um, writing with researching? Um, I keep my direct research to a minimum until I finish my first draft because I have found that that's the case there. Um, you can't always do this. But, some, but a lot of times you'd be surprised. You can write something. Uh, for instance, uh, in, the, um, in a recent book I did, The Way of Kings, I had a character who was the son of a surgeon and I wanted him to be a really good field medic. Um, he, he's, he's, he's a soldier and he's been applying what his father taught him to field surgery. I'm not a field surgeon. I don't know a lot about this. Um, I wrote the book, and in those scenes, I would even say things like, he makes it better. Um, and then I went and researched after the fact when I was sure I wanted this to be my character's, um, you know, one of my themes for the character, because, you know, there's, there's no way of telling if I'll even end up using all of that, or what I'll specifically need to know. And then I get to the situation, I'm like, all right, this is the wound. I can figure out how to make this better with minimal, you know, minimal resources for him. Um, and usually with research, I've found that you can get yourself, and that by doing that method, if you do like the, the, the base minimum research ahead of time, so, you know, a little bit of reading here and there to not sound completely like an idiot, then after the fact, do enough research to get your like, so, like yourself like 70% of the way there, and then give it to an expert for the other 30%, um, which is what we did with Wave Kings. We found a, a surgeon um, and said, here, read these scenes and tell me what I did wrong. And he fixed the little things that from there I would have had to have spent. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like this kind of parabolic scale where, you know, with, um, I did that backwards, didn't I? Maybe I didn't. With, uh, if this is amount of time you have to spend and this is how much you learn, you know, if, if you stop here, you're getting much more learning <coughs> for the amount of time spent. And this is the most effective up front. And then you can kind of do this amount. This amount would take so much more time that you just then give it to an expert and it's in enough of a state that they can fix it for you. Does that make sense? This is the method I found to be the most useful. That said, I do know writers that the research is what gets them into the story and gives them brainstorming necessary to write their book. They go read about a period in the middle medieval era and that gets them really excited. You know, I think this is how Connie Willis does it. Gets really excited about an era, reads for a year in that era, and then can sit down and write this brilliant book and that's their process. That is not my process. Uh, my process is I like to have control over the story. I'm not usually drawing as much from um, research. I'm, I'm using the research as a tool to enhance the story I already want to tell, rather than looking to the research for a story I want to tell.
Okay. Right here. How many of these do you juggle at one time? Do you only work on one, or do you have, like, two? Um, I write, uh, did I give you one? I didn't, did I? Woo! I should throw one at the camera so that they can, like, feel they're part of the class. Here you go. Um, I, um, <coughs> I, yeah, don't leave those on the floor, because I don't want people to step on them, but someone else can eat it if you don't want to eat it, or it went on the floor, and that's bad, but, you know, you're college students. You're eating food off the floor. I'm sure you are. Uh, <laughs> So it's, the, it's the law of being in college. If it's free, you eat it. It doesn't matter if you like it or not or where it's been. Um, I usually am writing new material on one book at a time, revising a separate book, and planning a separate book. That's the maximum I can do. Um, often I'm only doing one of the three, but at times I'm doing all three. I'm very rarely, if ever, writing two books at once. So do you like create one of these and decide you don't want to write it right now and then do a different one? Um, sometimes, but more likely... I'm, I've got this thing that I'm tweaking for one. While I'm finishing the end of another, I'm starting to fill in because at this point, you know, I, I've written 80% of the book and the other 20% is really well plotted at that point in my head. So there's not much brainstorming left to do. It's just a matter of getting it on the page. At that point, some of the brain space that had been devoted to that can start moving over to um, brainstorming the next book.